Today it's the turn for the one of the most popular neurotransmitters in the world, it's uh, dopamine. So dopamine is really famous because of its implications uh, since it works in reward system in some very famous pathologies like Parkinson's disease and others. And today we will check the physiology and the pathology like in the other videos. Hope you like it. So today's topic is a quite remarkable neurotransmitter, dopamine. Dopamine is not only important to us humans, but it has been important as a chemical messenger for thousands of millions even of years. Even plants, worms, parasites use dopamine as a chemical messenger. And we will see it shares a lot of its properties with other messengers like catecholamines. So, as I was saying, it belongs to a group of uh, transmitter of chemical transmitters called catecholamines. Why are they called catecholamines? Because they have a catechol ring, this, this one over here, and an amine group. This NH2, it's an amine group. And it shares the catechol ring with noradrenaline and adrenaline. Why is this important? Because the catechol ring is the... Um, the part of the molecule that allows it to attach to its uh, receptor. So, if all of the molecules share this catechol ring, all of the molecules can attach to the same uh, receptors. So, dopamine can activate noradrenaline and adrenaline transmitters, and it's only the these terminal uh, carbons that allow it to have more uh, affinity for the dopamine receptor, but it can attach to all of the receptors. Which are the most of the, the, the most important functions of dopamine? It has motor functions in uh, the basal ganglia. We will uh, watch it later. It, part it participates in the reward system and in hormone secretion. Very relevant, this hormone secretion, because most of the adverse events upon administering a dopaminergic drug is hormone uh, pathology. And so it can have functions as neurotransmitter or as a hormone, just like noradrenaline and adrenaline. So how does the body forms uh, dopamine? Basically, we need the amino acid L-tyrosine. It's very relevant L-tyrosine because you can see it has a catechol ring. So every catecholamine needs L-tyrosine to be synthesized. Once we have L-tyrosine in our body, tyrosine hydroxylase, basically what it does is it allows for hydroxylation. And we synthesize L-DOPA. L-DOPA is relevant because it can also be used as a, a drug. We administer L-DOPA to Parkinson patients, for example, to increase dopamine levels because Parkinson patients can't synthesize their own dopamine. And so we help them, giving them the precursor. Once L-DOPA reaches the brain, or is synthesized in the brain, L-DOPA, through an enzyme called dopa descarboxylase, synthesizes or transforms into dopamine, that is this molecule over here. And then finally, dopamine can be eliminated, so it doesn't, um, like, creates such a big message, so we want punctual messages, and the enzymes monoamine oxidase, MAO, and catechol orthomethyl transferase, COMT, transform dopamine into homovanillic acid. It's important to uh, mention that Mao and Compt will also help in the metabolism of other catecholamines like noradrenaline and adrenaline. Now, when we watch the brain, which parts of the brain synthesize dopamine? Well, basically, when we were first studying catecholamines, we found a lot of nuclei that produce them, and we couldn't differentiate them very well. So we started name naming them with the letter A and a number afterwards. Basically, letters or the nuclei from A1 to A7 are noradrenergic nuclei. And then on that name disappeared for noradrenaline, but for do dopamine it still ensues. So uh, we have uh, nuclei from A8 to A16 in dopaminergic transmission. The first one is A8 and A9. These ones are very important. They are known also as nigrostriatal area and this project to basal ganglia. These are extremely relevant to motor control, and this is especially the nuclei that are damaged uh, in Parkinson's. The second one is A10. A10 is the uh, ventral tegmental area that projects to the limbic system and the cortex. And this uh, is the entry for the reward system, so it creates reward um, conduct. A11 is very important because it projects to the medulla and the spinal cord and it modulates all the signals that come from the brain to uh, the periphery of the body and from the periphery to the brain.
So it's very important, for example, for pain or for some very precise movements. A12 and A14 are uh, hypothalamic nuclei and they control hormone secretion. So A A12 and A14 are the most important nuclei for hormone uh, release and hormone control. Synthesizing in uh, table, we have eight, a, 8 and 9 in the nigrus triadal that project to the basal ganglia and control motor functions. A10 is the um, ventral tegmental area, uh, part of the mesocorticolimbic pathway. It projects to limbic and cortex and its, uh, its function is specialized motor and motivation and reward. A11 is the posterior hypothalamus, it projects to spinal cord and medulla and modulates movement and sensation. A12 and 14 hypothalamic arcuate and preoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus and project to other hypotheses and hypothalamic nuclei controlling hormone secretion but also other functions like appetite or sexual conduct. A13 needs a place or a nuclei called sona incerta it projects to the hypothalamus and it controls also reproduction and sleep. And we have A16, that it's the cortex, especially olfactory cortex. It projects also to the olfactory cortex and is very important, especially in olfaction and in memories assigned to these olfactory stimuli. And in the retina, we also have an important dopamine synthesis place in the amacrine cells that upon activation modify the response of cones to light, increasing visual acuity. Now, outside of the, of the central nervous system, it's also very important. Uh, in the autonomic nervous system, we can synthesize dopamine, especially in the um, adrenergic medulla. Well, in adipocytes, it controls hormone release. In the kidney, renal blood flow and renal secretion. In the en endothelium, it causes vasodilation. In, in the immune system, immune suppression. In, in gastrointestinal uh, tissues, it decreases motility and secretion and decreases insulin release. So when we activate in the autonomic nervous system our medulla, this same area that produces adrenaline as a hormone, and we start synthesizing dopamine and releasing it uh, in the blood, acting so as a hormone, it will act on all of these tissues doing these uh, functions. Especially or, or especially important is the decrease in insulin release. As a matter of fact, some of dopaminergic uh, diseases or even some of dopam dopaminergic drugs can modify this insulin release and cause diabetes. For example, in uh, patients receiving antipsychotic treatment, they can, as an adverse reaction, have insulin resistance or, or diabetes and an increase in weight that is quite, quite relevant. Another important thing to mention is, since so many things in nature synthesize and use dopamine, like plants, like parasites, like even other animals, when we eat, it's only natural to absorb some of that, that dopamine that it's not ours, but it's in other uh, um, life beings or in other creatures. So the gastrointestinal system has a special mechanism in which an enzyme called SUL1A3 uh, adds a sulfate group to the dopamine that is not ours, that it's in the environment, so it doesn't generate functions that we don't need. This allows us to control very well the functions of dopamine in our body. It's thanks to this that allows the liver to capture and eliminate all of the dopamine we don't want to use. This is the schematics of a neuron. This is the presynaptic neuron, and this is the postsynaptic neuron. This is the synapse, uh, the synaptic cleft, and this is the astrocyte. So upon activation of the presynaptic neuron, we release dopamine into the synaptic cleft, and we will be uh, dealing with two groups of neurotransmitters. Basically, the D2 and the uh, sorry, the D1 receptor and the D1-like receptors. We will see a little further what does this mean. But basically, the D1 receptor that will be almost always postsynaptic. So it will not be in the same neuron that released uh, dopamine. And we'll have also the D2 and D2-like uh, receptors. D2 and D2-like receptors, they are postsynaptic, synaptic, and presynaptic. This is important because, as we will see in other neurotransmitters, almost always the presynaptic receptors are used as a counter-regulatory measure, as a feedback loop. So once we release dopamine, it will attach to this D2 receptor and it will inhibit this neuron and inhibit further dopamine release. And this will be also for dopamine. So D2 is 
a a inhibitory uh, receptor and the one is an excitatory receptor. And as with so many other neurotransmitters, upon release in the synaptic cleft, we will have to recapture this dopamine. Astrocytes and uh, uh, presynaptic neurons will have this dopamine transporter. This will take the dopamine and get it in the cells. And once it is inside the cells, the enzymes we have also mentioned, Mao and Compt, will metabolize it onto homovanillic homo acid, which will not have any excitatory or uh, any chemical properties. It is important to mention that this DAT, this dopamine transporter, can also transport and recapture noradrenaline, but it will be uh, more specific for this neurotransmitter. But it is shared by catecholamine, so we can also see here that much of the catecholaminergic messengers share properties and share transporters. We mentioned also uh, dopamine can serve as a, neuro, uh, a neurotransmitter and a hormone. Besides the adrenal medulla that produces dopamine as a hormone, the hypothalamus can also uh, release dopamine as a hormone so it reaches the hypothesis, the uh, anterior hypothesis. So basically what we'll do is that upon arriving to the anterior hypothesis, it will alter the, the uh, production and the release of a lot, a lot of uh, other hormones. It will basically inhibit the lactotrophs that produce prolactin, gonadotrophs that, pl that produce um, FSH and LH, the somatotrophs that will uh, inhibit the release of growth hormone, tyrotropes that will usually... Uh, release TSH and corticotrophs that will usually re release PUMC and further ACTH. So it is a key regulator with, uh, with GABA that we will re um, review in another video. It will be a key regulating step in hormone release. So alterations in dopamine, in hypothalamic dopamine, can generate a vast majority of alterations in hormone release. So as I was saying, we will have D1 receptors, and we will have another receptor that is very similar. We call it D1-like or D5 receptor. These two receptors are essentially excitatory receptors, so we will find it in the postsynaptic um, neuron. Basically, I will not go um, into much detail about the way it works, but basically when we attach dopamine to these receptors, it is attached to the G-protein complex, and upon dopamine binding, alpha will be released. The alpha subunit will activate adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase will grab all of the ATP it can find, and it will transform it into a second messenger called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP will, in turn, increase its concentration and activate a protein kinase A. It's called protein kinase A because it depends of cyclic AMP. And this protein kinase A will change the function of this cell. Basically, it will increase effector protein uh, function. For example, if we're talking about the heart, it will activate protein so it, the heart beats faster, for example. And it will also uh, activate a transcription factor, in this case CREV, that will further travel to the DNA of that cell and it will induce that cell to express more proteins and so it works even more. In the other hand, in the other corner, we have the D2 receptors and the D2-like, for example, it's D2, D3, and D4. Upon dopamine binding, this will also release the alpha subunit, but in this case, it will not activate adenylate cyclase, but it will inhibit it. So ATP will not be transformed into, a a into cyclic AMP, and the thus decreasing a a cyclic AMP concentration and inhibiting all of the functions of this cell. Besides inhibiting adenylate cyclase, the alpha subunit of these proteins will also prevent calcium entry and it will open potassium channels in some of the cells. So hyper it will cause hyperpolarization of these neurons, so they will not respond to electrical stimuli, and it will prevent some forms of plasticity through calcium binding and through preventing this calcium entry. As I said, it's the two, D2, two, D3, and D4. So when we get in the pharmacology, pharmacology, sorry here, it's with pH, I know, it, please forgive me. But when we talk about dopamine pharmacology, we have a lot of functions that we can manipulate through dopamine agonism or antagonism.
For example, we can use it as a, a hormone inhibitor. When we have a patient that has endocrine problems, for, for example, a tumor that secretes prolactin, uh, for example, in women, in women that it's more common, uh, women d develop these kind of tumors. They they have a lot of prolactin and they start they start milking even if they are not pregnant. We can administer a D2 agonist to block prolactin release. These are the main indications. Even in patients with diabetes, we can administer D2 agonists to change their hormone secretions. What are the problems? Since dopamine is everywhere in the brain, we have we can cause through our drug in the patient hallucinations, anorexia, because uh, the hypothalamus is in charge of feeding, as we have seen, and dopamine can alter these functions, and we can cause gastrointent gastrointestinal alterations. The main examples is bromocryptin and cavergolin. If we want to use it as an antipsychotic drug, we use D2 antagonists, so drugs that will bind to the D2 receptor and will not allow it to uh, function. We will use it in schizophrenia and psychosis patients. The, um, the problem here is that since dopamine is also essential for movement, will cause extrapyramidal syndrome, that it's like Parkinson's in a patient that was previously healthy, and tardive dyskinesia, also motor, motor problems because of the D2 block. Uh, the main examples are alloperidol, risperidone, and raclopride. In gastrointestinal alterations, we can use D2 antagonists as well. Uh, of course, these D2 antagonists usually don't cross the blood-brain barrier, but we can use it in patients that have nausea and vomit. Why does it function in nausea? Because it helps our stomach move, so it's something that is intoxicating us. It may advance in our intestinal tract, but also because nausea, we will watch or we will have a special class for that, is caused in a part of the brain called, called the area postrema, or postrema, and this area doesn't ha have a traditional blood-brain barrier, so our drugs can also reach this area of nausea. Which are the side effects? Once again, Parkinsonism and depression, very important. And which examples are relevant for these gastrointestinal functions? Met metoclopramide and domperidone. We can, we can also use the direct and ind indirect agonists, which activate the receptors, but not always in a direct fashion. We use them when we want to increase dopamine, uh, dopaminergic tone in the brain. And why would we want to increase it? For example, if our patient has Parkinson's and we want more dopamine to control this movement or erectile dysfunction, it is also used. It is no, no longer much used because of the Viagra that we now have. It's a better drug and it's a safer drug. But in some patients, you can still use um, these kind of drugs which are the main side effects, hypotension and psychosis, mainly because we have already mentioned, talking, speaking about the hypotension, that dopamine can directly vasodilate, so it can dilate our blood vessels. And the main examples, it's L-DOPA, I've already mentioned it, and apomorphin. And we can use also selective recapture inhibitors, so a drug that blocks this that enzyme or that transporter, allowing for dopamine to stay longer in the synaptic cleft and thus increasing its function, which, which this is basically the effect, increasing function. When, we, when do we use it? Basically for patients that have depression, tobacco addiction, ADHD, and obesity. Which are the side effects we can, uh, since we are increasing dopaminergic tone or increasing dopamine in the brain, and since dopamine is essential in the reward system, we can uh, create dependence, hallucinations, and we can also have anticholinergic effects for an increase, a too severe increase in dopaminergic tone in the basal ganglia. Uh, sorry. And the examples is bupropion, that it's used uh, a lot for tobacco dependence, and amphetamines, that it's used to increase the concentration, in, especially in child with ADHD and also in, in adult patients with ADHD. I will briefly mention the MAO inhibitors. These drugs are falling out of use because we have much safer drugs for doing basically the same. MAO inhibitors basically are compounds that block permanently the MAO enzyme. So it can increase dopamine, but it increases all of the cat cat catecholamines. So we can increase noradrenaline, 
we can include dopamine and adrenaline. And these are um, kind of dangerous drugs because we are increasing the concentration for a long, long time. We used to use them as antidepressants, so in depression and in Parkinson's. In Parkinson's they are still used, although, as I was saying, it's falling out of use. And the main side effect is toxicity uh, by catecholamine. So we have too many catecholamines in the brain and we have like a storm of these catecholamines. We can have psychosis, hypertension, we can have uh, tachycardia, we can have a lot, a, lot of, a lot of manifestations that are quite, quite dangerous. The main examples is selegiline and isocarboxacid. But I was, as I was saying, these drugs are falling out of use. Well, this is basically it for dopamine. If you want to know more, I leave you these um, references. You can change, you can check them out. They are quite good. Uh, most of the images were taken from Wikipedia. And thank you very much. Well, this is it for dopamine. Um, I hope you understood all uh, everything. If you have any doubts, leave them in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and, as always, help us change the world. Share the information.